and welcome to another glorious video of Theorycraft. I'm Ben, that's Jack, and our furry little companion, Boris Johnson. We are two dudes and a furry little guy who like to nerd out and rant out about various things. For this week, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, which Jack has not got an awful lot of clue on, Doctor Who. So, yeah. Today I want to sort of slightly rant about the sort of inconsistencies with the last two series and also my thoughts and feelings on the New Year special. So, the thing is with Doctor Who is its main gizmo or niche or whatever you want to call it is the fact that anybody can play the Doctor because the Doctor has the ability to regenerate which basically means that if he's dying, he can basically reheal his whole body, but it shapeshifts into a whole new person with a whole new personality, but he retains all of his memories from the prior ones. It's an interesting concept. It was only shoehorned in due to the original actor who was getting on quite old, and he was getting quite tired of the role because he just couldn't cope with the exhaustion and the various action scenes that was required of him being the doctor you needed a younger person to be as fit and yeah. so this concept has lasted for almost 60 years doctor who's been around for about 57 56 years great series there's been numerous people that have come and gone some versions of the doctor have been a bit iffy but it has been nonetheless an interesting series Jodie Whittaker then came along and rationalized, well, rebranded the whole series because she was the first ever female Doctor. Now, I have no bones about it. I think it's an interesting idea to try and swap the genders. They tested it out with a long-known villain to the Doctor called the Master, who then regenerated into Missy, who was yeah. played by a very interesting woman who was in Bad Education, and she was the sort of evil Scottish teacher in Bad Education. And she's played other baddie type villains as well. Michelle Gomez, uh, yeah, I, I believe. Know, yeah, yeah, I know who you're on about now. Wasn't that the same woman who was also in Harry Potter as well? I don't know if she was in Harry Potter, but she was in something else. She was in uh, Centurions, I believe. She was also one of the teachers for that. Indeed, but, yes. She was a hell of an actress. She played the act quite well. But the thing is, with Jodie Whittaker's Doctor, it always felt really half-assed because, as I've said many a times on various occasions, it's not always down to the actor's fault for a bad movie or bad TV show. More often than not, it's down to bad writing. And without a doubt, Chris Chibnall, the writer for the past two seasons, has well and truly scuffed it. <laughs> so, I mean, this... just like this is just me from like an outside viewer. I mean, I've not been a massive fan of Doctor Who. I've kept up with it over time, but it's just even I've noticed the gradual sort of uh, progression and so on. But as an outside viewer, even like for me, I can tell it's kind of just a bit, I don't know, it's just hit a slump. For me even i can tell that as an outside viewer yeah so the one thing that a lot of people have picked up on which i disagree with is how political they've made jodie whittaker's season so far now the thing right. is with doctor who to a degree it was meant to be quite political it was meant to be more thought-provoking the whole concept of doctor who was to make kids think more instead of it just being all about action it's about using words instead of violence that was the whole concept of the doctor is that being the good guy isn't about using blast guns and swords or whatever. It's about using words and being clever yeah. and making sure that you don't result in an out of, well, absolute cataclysm. Fair enough. I mean, there were some quite interesting episodes with Jodie Whittaker's one where you meet Rosa Parks. That was probably one of the most interesting episodes ever because it basically, they meet, Rosa Parks, the day where she is like changing history as a whole. Yeah. And it's basically the whole thing with Rosa Parks is that she doesn't move from her seat because she's tired from a long day. And that snowballed the whole 
rights movement within America. So within the episode, the Doctor meets her and her gang of people meet Rosa Parks. Towards the end of the episode, it's revealed that, oh, we can't move from this bus because if we do, we change the course of history. Now, that was an interesting little idea that they... Ah, had... that, that, that's pretty clever, actually. Well, this is it. Like, it was such a minor moment, but it's such a butterfly effect moment, which is I it... love the most. Oh, so it's kind of like talking about, like the se... was it like the segregation back then? Yes. So essentially, back in the rights move, well, back in America, before the whole rights movement, was that sadly people of color had to sit in certain designated areas on the bus. Yeah. And if there were more non colored people than there were colored, the white people had the right to sit on the seat and the colored people had to stand or get off the bus. But because she had a long day of work and was tired, and rightly so, anyone would be pissed off at that moment, she didn't move. And it was it's one of those key moments in history that's overlooked because, I don't want to go political, but the thing is with these days is that a lot of riots and stuff, while they are useful and while they do have their place in our society, they cause more problems than they solve because they're more chaotic than they are justifying the means yeah. of what they're protesting. Yeah, whereas when I like when I mentioned to you, especially about it was in a past episode, I cannot remember what it was, but you know, when you have oh yeah, when we talk about the comparisons between uh Magneto and Charles Xavier, where you had Martin Luther King who was more into doing peaceful protests, like speaking, mm -hmm. doing peaceful marches and explaining why they're doing the things they're doing. They said of Malcolm X, who, like, riots and so on. Yes. But the thing that I think a lot of fans have hated with the way that this series of Doctor Who ended, me mostly, is that they retconned the key part of the Doctor. So... Which is? The regeneration cycles are with the Time Lords is that there is a maximum of 13. They only gain this ability by going to the Academy and they're staring into something called the Void. The Void is basically the space between time and space itself, and it gives off radiation, which allows Time Lords to regenerate. Yeah. Great ability, great concept. After six, well, almost 60 years, Chris Chibnall's gone, oh yeah, by the way, the Doctor can do this unlimited times because he's somehow... The timeless child, this random child that a Gallifreyan found in the void. The Gallifreyan was called Tecte Yu, who was a scientist. She finds the child in the void, brings it back to Gallifrey. La -di -da, -di -da, -di da happy families. Child goes diving off a cliff. Tecte Yu goes, Ah, oh, no, child died! <laughs> so she, along those lines. So she goes to run to the child, like, thinking, like, I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm a healer, I must be able to help. All of a sudden, this child bursts into flames and regenerates into a new child, because that's how the regeneration process works. Right. So, from that moment, Tech 2 u becomes more of a lab rat doctor instead of a loving, caring sort of person, and basically kills the child over and over, experimenting on the child to figure out how the regeneration process triggers it. And then once she's perfected it, she uses it on herself, which then gives the whole Gallifreyan race the ability to regenerate. The timeless child is the Doctor. But then it gets yeah. even worse. It gets worse. Like They then also add into the idea that there's been previous versions of the Doctor prior to John Hurtnell, the, pre the very first Doctor, that was used as a war Doctor, as like a way of like invading random planets or whatever for the means of Gallifrey which is completely conflicting to the whole concept of the Doctor, but it's also just lazy writing saying, oh, yeah, the Doctor can regenerate forever now. Yeah, well done you. Well done you. It's like... The thing is, in the Doctor Who series, there are two... Well, there's two biological remnants of the Doctor that could technically be a female Doctor anyway, that could continue on the legacy without confusing things. Yes, yeah. So, the original series, the Doctor had a granddaughter called Susan. The main reason why he left Gallifrey was because he didn't want Susan to be... 
basically corrupted by the Time Lords to be used as a weapon because he had suffered at the hands of the Gallifreyan government or whatever you want to call it and basically rebelled against it and left Gallifrey. That's how the whole thing sort of starts. And then the Doctor basically says to her that she is better off being safe on Earth with this random guy. So he abandons her on Earth and he travels off, regenerates, and you never see Susan ever again. So you basically have a female Time Lord living on Earth who could be anybody at this point. You could have used her as the female Doctor instead. There's also... In David Tennant's series, it was where you had Donna Noble as a companion, which was played by Catherine Tate, which I'm not a huge fan of, but that's a subject for another day, who basically, they go to this random planet and they have workers of humans and these aliens called Hafs, which are basically feuding over for whatever reason, and they basically, whenever one dies, they basically dip their hand into a machine that clones them, but, like, splices the DNA to create a whole new person out of this previous person. So the Doctor gets stabbed, and he gets a clone daughter called Jenny. Fun fact, the woman that plays Jenny is David Tennant's wife in real life. Really? Yeah, at the time, they were married, and they still are to this day. And it's quite funny because the, she's also the daughter to the fifth doctor. She's a biological daughter to the actor that played the fifth doctor, I believe. I freaking hell, did not know that. So, in the many words of Doctor Who, for anybody who's watching this, it's wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. But there we go. <laughs> Don't get the... copyright struck, for God's sake. <laughs> But the thing is, by the end of that episode, she dies because she basically gets shot by a random character and David Tennant gets really angry and they leave the planet and that, they think that's the end of it. At the end of the episode, there's a bit of regeneration energy that comes out of her because she is a clone of the Time Lord and she just goes, <sighs> and she wakes up, scares the life out of everyone, grabs a random ship and then travels around the universe and you don't see any of her ever again. And it's like, so this is a Time Lord that has no, like, limitations in her DNA. She could literally become a Time Lord forever. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but then doesn't that completely negate the whole point of Doctor Who with the regeneration thing? Well, I think they limited it in the first place because they never expected it to be such a big thing. But because they sort of... They stopped it in the 80s. They brought it back as a one-off movie... And then it came back in 2005. It's had such a cult following since that they've had to rework things, which is fair enough because they have they've like added random things along the way to, again, confuse things th- further. But my issue is, is that instead of making the Doctor the time of the child, it could have been Susan or it could have been anybody. Why did it have to be the Doctor to make things even more complicated? I don't. I don't know. When it comes to things like retconning and so on, uh, like if it, like it's just if you're gonna have like sort of the like the, it's always seems to be like a main key component which gets retconned, which ends up pissing off fans. But then again, I suppose like retconning happens by certain writers and songs. Maybe they're pushed to do something different because otherwise, with Doctor Who, well, mind you, it. it do you need to tra- change the formula of Doctor Who if it's like like it's been the same for all these decades and it still works to this day? Is it kind of uh, maybe having to change having to change something drastic just to keep the interest? But then again, that creates more questions and more complications, doesn't it? Well, the thing is, I've said to you many times. A lot of the time, when people change things, it's not because they want to change it for the better. It's because they want to be. They just want to show off. Like at the end of the day, it's basically saying, "This is me. Look at what I can do." And it's just like, let's just change yeah, it for the sake of changing it. it. Yeah, basically. But the other thing as well is, I looked at the synopsis for the New Year special, and it's pretty much mimicking a prior episode that's already been done in the like most recent. Well, during one of the previous Doctor's storylines. Right. So with Matt Smith, 
One of his earliest episodes was called Victory of the Daleks. He basically gets called up by Winston Churchill because they're best buddies, and he gets summoned back to 1940-something to basically take a look at this new piece of technology that someone's concocted to win the war in World War Two. Yeah. It's later revealed that this miniature tank is actually a Dalek, but the, nobody believes him because back in 1940, nobody's seen Daleks yet because timeline like Daleks never really the first time the Daleks came about was in the 1960s so it would make sense that nobody recognized what Daleks were the doctor knows what it is but nobody else does wait so uh if they didn't appear till the 1960s why are they in the 1940s in that timeline so basically in that timeline they create a false storyline they make them uh, the guy that supposedly invented them is actually an android that they invented to try and like, cor corroborate the story. But they right. basically say that they've crash landed in the 1940s and due to the fact that they are so damaged, their own computer system doesn't recognise them as their own species. Right. So they had to lure the Doctor back in time to try and like voice recognize it so they could access their system so they could like create a whole new race of Daleks. Yeah. The reason for this was that behind the scenes, the Daleks that they'd already made prior was for the height of Billy Piper, who is about five eight. So it was yeah. perfect eyeliner height. But the problem is, is that the actress Karen Gillan is about six foot give or take. So it would have been that she was too tall. So the whole concept was that they had to remake Daleks that would be tall enough to be eyeline with her and thus create a whole new race of Daleks. Right. But the whole the whole thing with that was funny because everyone kept saying that it was Mighty Morphin Daleks because there was one of each colour, like the Power Rangers. <laughs> but the thing is, they've now used the same concept in the New Year special where the new version of Daleks, which I hate, absolutely hate, have been labelled by the UK government in the modern day as attack drones. But the thing is, there's been so many Dalek attacks in the past 10, 15 years since Doctor Who came about, and they have done episodes in the modern day, that that can't work. Unless it is set in a different reality, which it can't be, because they got, they've brought back another old school companion, which everybody loves, played by John Barrowman, known as the face of Bo, Captain Jack Harkness. His character is so complicated, I would need uh, more if than this point, time. Would that take an episode in itself? Yes, pretty much. But Captain Jack Harkness is a brilliant character, nonetheless. He got his own spin-off series called Torchwood, which the reason why it was called Torchwood was because it was an anagram of Doctor Who. But Torchwood, I have actually watched. I've seen a few episodes. Excellent. So Doctor Who and Torchwood obviously are parallels to one another. Great series. I wish they did more. Yeah. But the last, sure. well, the last thing that I remember watching was um, Children of Earth, and that was the most creepy episode of Torchwood I'd ever watched. <laughs> like. Torchwood is like Doctor Who on acid, I swear, because it is so gory, <laughs> it's so dark, it's brilliant. Like, but the thing is, it's like with Doctor Who for the past few years, it's not been scary, it's been more comical and more wacky, if anything else, yeah. which kind of undoes the whole thing of Doctor Who as a whole. I, su I suppose so, but then again, I have like... When you were when you were taking me through the whole repertoire of various like characters and so on, like the uh, especially some really scary characters, like the whole concept of them. What are they called? What are they called? Are they called Weeping Angels? Yes. Yeah, like the ones that is yeah. Because isn't it every time you is it if every time you blink they move or yeah. So basically, the Weeping Angels have this re really weird concept that they have. Retroactive camouflage, I believe, is what the doctor calls it. So basically, as long as you look at them, they can't move. Right. If, they, if you take your eyes off, if you blink, if you take your eyes off for a second, they can move. 
And if they touch you, they can send you back in time and they literally siphon off the potential timeline energy as a way to feed. It's it's really weird. It was they were introduced in David Tennant's second series, and the first person that they get is a policeman that is trying to flirt with this random woman who comes across the whole thing in the first place called Sally Sparrow. And the policeman... Yeah, great name, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. But this policeman is of ethnic origin. He's got a Jamaican accent. And so he basically, he's trying to sort of investigate what's going on. And a weeping angel comes right up behind him, grabs him, and he zapped back into the 1960s. That's so then, hell. five seconds later, Sally Sparrow gets a phone call from his present day self that's a lot older because he's an old man. Yeah. Oh my God. So he's in hospital and he basically has a message for her to give to her from the doctor because the whole thing is that the angels have taken hold of the TARDIS. So he got stuck in the 1960s without his TARDIS. So he's had to try and find a way of getting it back from them. And the weirdest concept is that basically he message it, he finds a way of messaging her via recording himself, which gets put on like these random DVDs that she already owns as like Easter eggs on DVDs. Yeah. So she has a conversation with him, but it's all one-sided. So, like, he says a load of stuff, but nobody knows what it means. But because she's having a conversation to the recording, it makes more sense. And then it's like, they get into the TARDIS. One of the DVDs that they got on her actually is, like, this chip that they can use on the TARDIS to send back to the Doctor so he can get back to where he was. Right. <laughs> and then... The best bit of all is like the TARDIS is leaving without her and her friend. So it's like, they're like, don't leave us. Don't let us be attacked by the angels. But because all the angels are like one on each side of the TARDIS, they're all looking at each other as it's disappearing. Yeah. So they're permanently fixed because they're looking at each other. They cannot move because they're looking at each other. Yeah. And it's just the most freaky episode ever. And it's like, they look like statues, but they're actually played by actors. Like, they... How still of... do you have to be? I know, it is so trippy, and it's such a good episode. The Weeping Angels is underused, but it's one of those things where it's so predictable that you can't do much else against it. But... The thing is, is the, with the Daleks, they have been used so much to the point where I don't find them that frightening anymore. They're just, they're just part of the show and they redo it, they redo it, they've brought in, they've taken away, they've revamped it God knows how many times. But at the end of the day, it is a wheelie bin with a plunger and a whisk for a weapon. <laughs> That's the thing, the, from an out from an outside perspective, like from an outside perspective, I don't, I never got into Doctor Who. It was never my thing. But when I was just like saying, but even when I was just look at the Daleks, even when I was younger, when I'd seen like just all these episodes and like clip TV clips and snippets of the Daleks, I think mean, how in the hell are these things supposed to actually be scary? What the well, hell is this? Well, the thing is, it's like in the original series. The funny thing was, is like the Daleks were unstoppable, apart from the fact that they couldn't go upstairs. So you could literally outrun a Dalek because it couldn't go upstairs. That was like one of the most comical things about oh, yeah. Doctor Who. But when they brought back the series back in 2005, the first Dalek you get gets upgraded so it can fly. And then it's like, oh shit. <laughs> Because the thing is with the Daleks is that it has the most stupid... Vo it has a very interesting voice. And like when they fire up the weapons, they have to say, Exterminate! Because it charges up the weapons. Exterminate! Exterminate! <laughs> yeah. But I the problem is, is like when it was about to fly, it look it's at the bottom of the stairs, and everyone's at the top going, 
Oh, we're fine here. It can't go upstairs. We're safe. And the head just slowly tilts, going, Elevate! And oh, it slowly God. rises. And then everyone, you can tell everyone's just crap their pants. They're like, fuck. But <laughs> it just makes me laugh that it took until 2005 to get the right CGI to be able to do that in the first place. Because I bet you there was people that wish they could do it, but they just didn't have the special effects. Yeah. I mean, there have been a lot of times where they've tried bringing in previous monsters, and some of it's worked, some of it hasn't. I mean, it's like the very first episode, they brought in a very old school Doctor Who villain called the Autons, which were basically like this living plastic. And, oh my Christ, it was so funny. There's a scene where Rose's boyfriend, Mickey, who is of ethnic origin, gets attacked by an Auton that's disguised as a plastic wheelie bin. Yes, I know. Like, the guy is literally being chased down the street by a wheelie bin, so he's looking behind him, and he's like, what the fuck is this? And he puts his hand on it to try and <laughs> shut it. You actually got this image of a wheelie bin just going... Oh, no, 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 it gets worse than that. So he gets it, he goes to close the lid on it. He gets stuck because it's living plastic. It then throws him in the air and he, like, goes, hop, like Pac Man. And then he gets captured by the Autons. But then they make a plastic version of him, which looks so bad because it's like, it's the actor, but with like fake plastic around him to make him look like a fake version. So it basically reminds me of Rimmer. That's got a black cousin from Red Dwarf. Well, it's just like there's like that. I I know of the cyber. I know the Cybermen, which are pretty popular. Cybermen. Oh, okay, that in itself is a very confusing mess because. Then, yeah. So the original version of the Cybermen, they came from a, a moon that orbited Earth called Mondas. The original Cybermen were just terrible like i swear they literally went to the kitchen drawer and just got as much tinfoil as possible and a sock tinfoil and a sock what if you ever get if anybody ever gets a chance look up like the first generation version of cybermen because it just it is so shockingly bad they even reused that concept in peter capaldi's second or third series and yeah. it's just like it looks so bad and then it was like in the newer Who, they brought in the concept that there is Cybermen from a parallel Earth, which looked quite menacing. And then they rebranded it again so that anything becomes a Cyberman. And it's like it's like nanites that take over the body, which made it a really con interesting concept. But it failed miserably when it kind of like got defeated by the Doctor purely because... It was having a game of chess with the Doctor. So basically what happened was that Mass Matt Smith's Doctor got attacked by some of the nanites, which was a really cool concept. And the thing is with Time Lords is their brain processing power is a lot stronger than the average human because he's a Time Lord, he's alien, like it makes sense. Yeah. So half of his body was like being controlled by the Cybermat and the other half was being controlled by him. They have an inner battle between the two, discussing one another, like who should have the other, like the final percentage to have like the full control of the body. But because the doctor is so powerful, he's like, yeah, well, tell you what, we'll have a game of chess to like decide who's the winner. While he's doing that, the Siberium needs all brain, all power possible to just fight the doctor. So it basically disengages from everybody that is already like assimilated into the system and then the doctor goes oh yeah by the way because you're so distracted doing that i was able to do this and he gets a random bit of like a gauntlet to like taser the side of his face that has it goes right and then that's it like that's the end of the episode yeah, I know. Like he literally tases himself. The Cybermat doesn't stick to him, and everyone's free. And it's like, okay, right, fair enough. But then you get at the end of the last Doctor Who episode before we get the New Year special, the 
the Time Lord, known as the Master, has gone to Gallifrey, destroyed Gallifrey after everything that's been going on, and basically converted everyone on t on Gallifrey to be a hybrid of Cybermen and Time Lord. As you do. As you do, which look pretty ace. But then that has a design flaw in itself, which means that if the Doctor is able to like, reject it, why weren't the other Time Lords? I, s I suppose, yeah, you got the point. But the thing is, like, the whole reason why the Master did it was that he wanted to see if, like, if you shot someone that was part Gallifreyan and part time, uh, sorry, part Cyberman, would they regenerate? So he has a controller to control them all and basically points to one and says, right, you, shoot him. So they do. And he goes, ah, oh, that's a bit disappointing. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> and they regenerate. <laughs> and then it's like, it's an infinite loop of cyber warriors that cannot die. Oh and then the doctor God. is like, and then it's like, ah, oh, shit. And then the doctor ends up being teleported. Sorry, doctor goes back onto her TARDIS. She then gets infiltrated by space police because there is a thing called space police in Doctor Who and basically gets taken to space prison, which is known as Sharda. Great. Okay. So how, yeah, like, uh... well, I know because obviously, like those were the ones which I knew of. There's another one which you told me about, which I got a massive kick out of because I swear we have these around where we live. Because for those of you who are watching, me and Ben don't live too far apart. He's literally like a point ten, fifteen minute walk away from me. And obviously, because of the situation, we're having to do this, and soon we'll be able to get back into his studio, aka living room. Uh, but eventually, uh, so why we have a load of these walking around at the moment, but I, I got I to gotta know again the explanation of what adipose are. Uh, adipose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so adipose are most, is the most adorable alien on all of Doctor Who. They're not deadly, but the reason behind them is. So... <laughs> Basically, there's this woman that comes from a different planet, but somehow looks human, was set in charge by the adipose race to replenish their livestock because their one of their many moons had just suddenly disappeared. So this woman creates a pill that basically converts human fat into walking adipose dingly bobs, which is fair enough. Like people lose weight and you get a whole new race of aliens. Done deal, not a problem. But the problem is, is like, well, you get Donna Noble who is investigating this whole thing, and so is the Doctor. That's how like they bring back Donna throughout this in like on her first official episode, and basically, she has this necklace that is like an activation switch for these adipose. So she's sort of faffing around with the necklace because, as you do, like it's a piece of jewelry. But the problem is, is that like, she's interviewing one of these people that's taking these tablets. And as she's like fiddling the necklace, the woman's in the bathroom and she's like, oh, I don't feel so good. She thinks she's having stomach cramps. No, it's part of her fat that's being converted into the adipose and it pops off into her, into the sink. And she's like, what the fuck is that? And it's like, all of a sudden there's whoop, whoop, whoop. This woman that's in charge of this whole thing is like, oh, shit, right, we've been found out. So, to like, stop this whole fiasco from like getting on the news or whatever, she decides to accelerate the like conversion to the point where the entire woman is turned into adipose. Like, her entire flesh, body, bones, everything is converted into adipose. It's just like, okay... Well, to stop this, to stop this race of aliens, it would inspire everybody to get back in the gym and eat healthy. <laughs> but Adipose is just Doctor Who's version of probably Ewoks from Star gremlins. Wars. That's the. Cl it's not even Gremlins. Like at least with Gremlins, they can be slightly vicious. Adipose aren't vicious at all. It's just the way that they're like created as like a byproduct of human fat. But, yeah, I suppose so. Like I say, with Doctor Who as a whole, 
I'm a bit unsure in terms of how things are going to happen for the new series because while I do like the idea of having a female Doctor, there have been some iffy moments such as her sonic screwdriver looks beyond dodgy. Like, the oh, sonic screw- I, I, I know where you're going with this one. Is it because the sonic screwdriver looks a bit phallic? Yes. So... The thing is, she makes shifts the sonic screwdriver out of steel that she finds in a steel industry in Sheffield because plot. Like, the whole thing with the Doctor is that she crash lands in Sheffield, she loses the TARDIS, she loses her sonic screwdriver, she's fighting a Dalek. The Dalek is on its, like, last legs as well because that... The way that they've redone Daleks in the new series, I don't like because... It's a scrapyard Dalek, and while I do understand that, obviously, they're trying to keep the idea of Daleks fresh, I'm trying to wrap my hand around the idea of Dalek weaponry being able to be repaired by Sheffield Steel. Like, it's... Yeah, exactly. That's my thoughts. It's just such a bizarre concept. Because the whole thing with the Daleks is that their suits or their mech armor, or whatever you want to call it, is made from Dalekadian, which is like the strongest substance in the entire Doctor Who universe. Like, it's able to travel through space. It's able to travel through the void without any damage whatsoever. Yeah. So I can't even remember what reason it was that they had to repair it, but it repairs itself with Sheffield Steel. But it has lost some of its like mass because there wasn't enough steel. I think the whole concept of this episode was basically to try and publicise the whole idea that we need to open up steel works again because we're leaving Brexit and all this bollocks. But yeah, yeah. I kind of I kind of like that. I kind of like that though. I like when series like kind of take the piss out of themselves and what's going on with current events. I quite like that actually. Yeah, I do too, but the problem is, is like, if you get too political, it ends up ruining the whole seriousness behind the politics, if that makes sense. I suppose so, yeah. But, like I say, all I can hope for this episode, for the New Year's special, is that, one, we get more of an explanation as to what Captain Jack's been doing, two... To try and figure out what the fudge Chris Chibnall's done to Jody, well, to the Doctor's backstory, and two, well, sorry, three. I just hope that for the next series that we get some more sci-fi instead of politicalness. Well, yeah, like, I, like take it back to where it started. Take it back to where it started. It's all sci-fi. The point of being sci-fi is that it's not political. Obviously, yes. with elements in it. But you have to stay true to a certain concept, especially with Doctor Who, and even I know that. Yeah. So, there we go. It's not been much of an episode this week. Thanks for joining us, everybody, if you do watch us at all. Again, give us a like, subscribe, and give us a comment down below what you think we should talk about next. Next week's topic is obviously going to be for Jack, and what's going to be next week's episode? Next week's episode is going to be something which we have. It's gra- this topic is gradually coming to every sort of uh, movie and such that we've spoken about, and it specifically re- relates to some a lot of superhero movies, which are the most identifiable ones. So we're going to be crisscrossing between DC, Marvel, and some other films as well. But it's the um, it's the concept of how exactly that our superheroes and iconic costumes are meant to look versus what we actually got you know yes. and so if you take kind of the x-men uh for example the x-men black leather suits and obviously we weren't happy with them because we wanted the yellow spandex yes so it was just an example but that's what we're going to get into for next week yeah so we're basically doing fails of concept art versus reality so again thanks for joining us It's not much of an episode, but stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.